Good morning. I'm Jennifer Morrison. I'm going to talk about Dr. Crisco here for a minute. He's going to present. He's an interventional cardiologist with First Coast Heart and Vascular here in Jacksonville. He's originally from North Carolina. His training in medicine began at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill School of Medicine. Then he went on to University of Michigan for internal medicine. And then finally, he was at Emory University in Atlanta for cardiology and interventional cardiology. He performs catheter-based diagnostic interventional procedures here in the community every day. And today, he's here to update us on women in heart disease. He's also the medical director of the Sarah Cannon Institute at Memorial Hospital here in Jacksonville. His talk today is entitled, Fight Like a Girl, Beating Heart Disease in Women. Dr. Crisco. First, I'd like to thank you for coming out today uh, to the Lunch and Learn here at WJCT. Um, I was uh, engaged by uh, industry uh, here in the, in the community to identify specific topics related to underrepresented populations in the cardiovascular disease uh, research and access. And one of those underrepresented populations is actually women. And uh, if you'll just uh, take some time and listen to me, hopefully we can uh, uh, educate you about uh, fighting like a girl, beating heart disease uh, in women. So uh, most talks we begin with disclosures to make you understand that I have no financial interest to disclose, but I wish I did. <laughs> um, I've yet to find a conflict of interest with a business or a company and the topic of women and heart disease. Um, I do not specialize in women's health care, but at least half of my patients are female. And I cannot rule out the influence of my own Y chromosome in my opinion uh, or my experience. Uh, and to give this talk, I am expected to be sensitive to women issues. And I will try my best, but be aware some of this discussion includes references to lightning rod subjects such as bait, body weight and diet. So just bear with me. So when people... Um, uh, when I tell them I'm an interventional cardiologist, um, the question is, what is that? And what you see here is uh, a heart catheterization laboratory with me positioned here and the camera and the patient. And we deal with the blood supply to the heart predominantly, but I also deal with the blood supply in every other part of the body, the carotids to the brain, the aorta, the kidney arteries, the peripheral arteries to the legs. What you see here is a right coronary artery that's closed and somebody's having a heart attack. And we, through a catheter, put a wire through here, do a balloon stent procedure to reestablish the blood supply in the setting of a heart attack. And I do this every day, predominantly at Memorial Hospital. Um, this is an image of an artery and a stent being deployed, and the stent keeps the plaque open. Um, I'm an interventional cardiologist. Let's hope you don't need me. I am on staff at several other hospitals, though, Baptist Center, Downtown, Baptist South, St. Vincent South, Orange Park, Memorial, and Flagler Hospital. So my group covers a lot of territory, um, and we're certainly here to meet uh, the cardiovascular needs of the community. Um, so this slide sort of represents uh, a background to understand the uh, baseline distribution of the difficulty of this topic. <laughs> women are more complicated. Yes, women are more complicated than men. But you have some recent role models um, that really have helped me generate the discussion here about uh, fighting uh, and, and beating. Uh, and uh, they said, I fight like a girl, and that's good. Um, of course, the US women's soccer team, uh, Ronda Rousey, who recently lost to uh, Holly Holm in the, uh, the MMA fights. But what, you, what we have here is a bunch of positive healthcare role models. These are women who are active and are healthy and are focused on athletics. And it does give me a background to say, you know, it's time for you to fight as well. And what you should be fighting against is the number one killer of women. So the agenda today is to dispel the myths about cardiovascular disease in women and to first raise awareness of cardiovascular disease as the number one killer of women in the Western world. And from that, I have a case from just two weeks ago that I'm going to show you. We're going to help you identify your own risk. I want you to know your numbers, your blood pressure, your weight, your cholesterol, your fasting blood sugar. And I want you to consider knowing if you're sitting there growing plaque. Plaque's what flakes off and closes the arteries down. And that can be done by looking at things like a calcium score. 
We're here to help you know your inherited risk, but also your contributable risk. That is activity level, nutritional choices, smoking, exercise, this type of thing. And to help you understand how to lower your own risk. Exercise, weight management, dietary choices, optimize blood pressure, avoiding tobacco products, and optimizing cholesterol. So this, this is a real case from um, November 14th, and uh, my day started with a 38-year-old woman waking up at home with chest pain that was unrelenting. 38 years old, remember this. She has a history of untreated high blood pressure. She's a, a smoker and a mother of five. Um, untreated in the sense that when I saw her when she arrived, I said, uh, do you have high blood pressure? And she said, yeah, but I haven't been taking my medicines for five years. She goes to the Memorial Hospital emergency room at Kernan and Atlantic, and an EKG is done suggesting an acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And in the modern era, that's uh, digitally transmitted to my handheld cell phone. And I look at it, and it looks like a heart attack. And I call them back and I say, I'll meet you at the cath lab at Memorial Hospital. So I get it. I'm the, what's called the STEMI doc. And the STEMI doc is the ST elevation myocardial infarction doc. That means the heart attack doctor that day. And so emergent medical stabilization happens at the uh, freestanding ED, but she comes to the heart catheterization laboratory. This is the image of her heart catheterization. This is what's called the right coronary artery to the bottom part of the heart. You have the spine here, the head's up here, the chest is here, the feet are down here. This artery supplies blood to what's sitting in the middle, which is the pumping heart. This is her left coronary system, left main, circumflex, LAD. But what you don't see here is a vessel right here. And this is the biggest of the three, called the left anterior descending, and it's the missing mid-LAD. You don't see it. So we threw a guide wire, I put a guide wire down the vessel, we balloon it, and we put some stents to open it up. So here's before, you don't see this vessel, terminates here. This is after, reestablishing the blood supply. And so what we do is we get a better blood supply to this part of the heart so it doesn't die. And this is all done emergently. Um, patients are, by the time they get to the hospital, we try to get the artery open on a national recommended before 90 minutes. We're typically below 60 minutes at Memorial. We're very good at this. Um, and this reestablishes the blood supply, takes away the chest pain, saves heart muscle. And the faster we can do this, the better heart function she has, because the longer it takes, this heart muscle is going to die. So what went wrong here? Well, it's pretty clear she failed to understand her own risk for this type of an event. She failed to address the risk factors that could reduce her risk, high blood pressure management, and she was a smoker. But what went right? What went right was she recognized the symptoms, she called 911, she received modern health care, but what happens next? It's medical care, follow-up, risk factor modification, because she's, if she's already had one heart attack, she's at risk for another one. We want her to help raise those five kids and be thankful every day because sudden death is often the first symptom of a heart attack. People always ask me, how many heart attacks happen uh, every year in your community? And it's statistics, we're done at one time on this, only about 25% of people with a heart attack show up at an emergency healthcare situation. That's because 50% die suddenly. Done. 25% stay at home, think they had an ulcer, live through it, seek their healthcare when they have a problem related to that soon after that. Probably go to their primary care doctor as opposed to an emergency situation. But only 25% call 911 and get to us. So there's a big opportunity if people can understand the symptoms, but also understand your own risk for this. Because if you say, I'm a low risk patient, it's hard to lower my risk. But if I'm a high risk patient, I got some risk to lower, right? So here's the myths that we're gonna dispel about cardiovascular disease, specifically related to women. Cardiovascular disease is mainly disease of old men. That's myth number one. This is data from the American Heart Association looking at years, 1979 to 2000, 
In dark blue is the rate of cardiovascular mortality among males, and then in light blue among females. So as a matter of fact, higher mortality among females. But as we see here since 2000, uh, out to 2009, the mortality trends are coming down. And this is encouraging, but the difference here really is where we have some work to do to actually lower them both and make them equal. If you look at this uh, graph, it looks at um, cardiovascular disease being the leading cause of death among women. And this is per 100,000 population coronary disease. Um, both of these are women, but in white, it's white females, and in blue, it's black females. Coronary disease remains the number one leading cause of death among women, and it's more than stroke, it's more than lung cancer, and it's more than breast cancer. Um, I could offer to you, though, that more women in their 50s are scared of this diagnosis than they are this one, but again, it's about five-fold increase among uh, the population to die of heart disease. And then this graph looks at really the age distribution among women of cardiovascular disease diagnosis and annual deaths. Our patient was 38. So even though predominantly death related to heart disease is more common among older women, it clearly is present all the way down in age. And as we saw with our 38-year-old mother of five, she was a victim of a heart attack. So more than 35,000 women under the age of 65 die annually in the United States of cardiovascular disease. Myth number two, women don't need to worry about cardiovascular disease before menopause. Historically, there was this concept that the ovaries were protective of you related to your heart attack risk. What the new thinking really is, is that the relationship between early menopause uh, and accelerated cardiovascular disease is more of a spectrum of risk over time with menopause just being an event as opposed to menopause going from a low risk to a high risk patient. So as we see, our, our patient was premenopausal. She was 38, but she had a heart attack. So it's not as if menopause suddenly flips you from a low risk to a high risk patient, but there's a continuum of risk over time. And really, this diagram looks at coronary heart disease progression over decades, decades in time. And this is a vessel, the wall of the vessel, blood going through the vessel, but the development of plaque in the wall of the vessel over time, seeing how er in early stage it's mild. As the plaque progresses in the vessel wall, it actually begins to stay there. And it's actually the rupture of this plaque that is the inciting event to close this pipe down and cause a heart attack if this is the artery going to your heart. Alternatively, if this is the artery going to your brain, we call it a stroke. So what you, call, what you see here is um, age is a predictor of risk, but also your inherited risk. But these are some of the uh, attributable risk factors over time. Smoking, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, diabetes, inactivity, and obesity put you at risk for the development of this over time. So really, the reality is being premenopausal probably does not protect you from cardiovascular disease, and you should be vigilant about your risk at all ages. Plaque calcifies in the wall of the vessel, and this can actually be identified um, with a CT scan. CAT scans can actually pick up the presence of calcium in the vessel wall, and when the plaque's been there long enough, it starts to calcify. So cholesterol is a number to know, but the vessel wall is where the risk is. This uh, series of uh, pictures depicts uh, the identification of calcium in the wall of vessels to your heart. And what you see here are these specules of calcium that can be picked up by the CAT scan on several planes here. And we look at how much calcium over time. So here's years to an event, and here's calcium score. And what you see here is um, as your calcium score increases, your event rate increases. So consider getting a calcium score. It'll tell you whether you're sitting there growing plaque or not, and that's the disease that we're trying to slow down. Again, calcium scoring is a CAT scan, it's a test, can tell you whether you're sitting there growing plaque or not. So my, today I'm gonna give you a bunch of prescriptions. The first one is um, get some labs done, know your fasting lipid panel, what your cholesterol is, and then consider getting a calcium score, and we can cut this out and you can take it home. Myth number three, 
Hormone replacement therapy is dangerous to the heart and should not be undertaken it in any circumstances. There's a lot of women um, who are scared to take hormone replacement therapy. There's other women that if you take it from them, they'll kill you, right? <laughs> so um, what, we, what we're talking about is estrogen, and estrogen, of course, is critical to the reproductive function of both men and women, but uh, it's mostly produced in the ovaries. Um, some uh, estrogen arises from fat and liver and breast and adrenal glands. And it really has complex physiologic effects and really affects our whole body, the brain, the heart, the ovaries, the vagina, the bones, the uterus, and the breasts. Um, what you see here is sort of the life cycle of uh, the ovarian hormone estrogen over time and the ovarian uh, hormone progesterone over time. And really it increases with age, and this is menopause, where we have these big swings in estrogen levels, and really the perimenopausal symptoms, I don't have to go into if you're a woman in the audience, it's hot flashes, insomnia, mood changes, and there's probably 15 other things not listed here. Um, menopausal physiology is really, it's related to osteoporosis and some other things. So, you know, the question is, is if I get hormone replacement therapy to calm down these symptoms, does that affect my cardiovascular risk? That's a good question. Uh, so the good parts, it does relieve menopausal symptoms. Uh, it reduces osteoporosis, that's bone thinning. It reduces fracture rates. The question is, is it cardioprotective? It does actually change the lipid panel, and we used to think that was helpful. The bad side of it is it does increase breast cancer risk, it changes uterine cancer risk, and it's, it really it's a complex formulation because we use equine estrogen, that's from a horse, that's what's typically in those pills. So this was studied. This was studied actually out of the NIH sponsored trial called the Women's Health Initiative, where they enrolled over 16,000 patients, and these are all women, aged 50 to 79, and to get in the trial, you had to have an intact uterus. And they looked at giving you estrogen or, and progesterone versus placebo, and they followed you over time for about six years. The, the answers and the outcomes were the following. Hormone replacement, that's this arm, was associated with an increased risk of heart disease of 29%, an increased risk of stroke for 41%, it increased blood clotting, and it increased breast cancer 26%, but it reduced colon cancer, and it reduced hip fractures. And again, this is age 50 to 79 with an intact uterus, so we would only basically draw conclusions relative to this population. So hormone replacement therapy really should not be used to prevent heart disease in the healthy postmenopausal woman. Overall mortality, though, was identical, and the rates in both groups were low. Um, and then, you know, whether this really, this combination in the modern era influences, influences outcomes is difficult to know because they've changed the dose since that study was done back in the 70s and 80s. So then they looked again at hormone replacement therapy, but only estrogen versus placebo. And in this part of the Women's Health Initiative estrogen only study, they looked at the same age, but with a prior hysterectomy, again, not needing the progesterone and again looked over seven years. But here, this study reduced heart disease by 9%, although it increased stroke and increased clotting, there was no change in cancer, and there were fewer hip fractures. Um, this breaks it down by age group, and what you should see here is age 50 to 59 reduced heart disease, but as we got older, it increased heart disease. So there's really an age-related benefit or risk that should be appreciated. So in younger men, women, uh, postmenopausal women, with a prior hysterectomy, estrogen alone may be beneficial is the conclusion. Estrogen therapy is reasonable for the relief of symptoms if started early. Uh, really should not be given to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease because it might increase it. And unfortunately, by the time you know, this was published, they've changed the doses and all the pills that are out there, so it's very difficult. It's a moving target. So my take home for you today is it's complicated, so discuss it with your doctor. So the prescription today is regarding hormone replacement therapy, discuss it with your doctor. It's really too complex for this forum. Myth number four, 
Vitamin supplementation is key to preventing disease in women. I cannot tell you how many people bring in every supplement known to man to my office and ask me, does this reduce my risk for a heart attack and a stroke? Well, to tell you honestly, there's only been two vitamins studied in cardiovascular disease. I'm going to show you the data. This is the vitamin E primary prevention study, again, NIH sponsored. Why is the NIH sponsoring this? Because no one's going to pay for it otherwise. Let's see whether a vitamin does it or not. 39,000 women, age greater than 45, got vitamin E or placebo over 10 years, 636 deaths in one arm, 615 in another, basically the same outcome, not statistically different. And they looked at these outcomes, total mortality, heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular death, cancer, and cancer death, and in a sense, this women's health study with vitamin E does not support re recommending vitamin E uh, for the cardiovascular disease prevention or cancer prevention among women. No benefit in reducing CV death. Well, doctor, what about vitamin B? I'm a big vitamin B fan. 5,000 women with heart disease either got vitamin B or placebo, and again, looked at over seven years, almost the same events. No benefit in reducing the death. These are equivalent numbers. Statistically speaking, no difference. So the reality about vitamins, at least E and B, is that vitamins are probably safe. They're probably not bad for you. But there is no convincing evidence that they need to be taken regularly, and they do not reduce cardiovascular risk. Some supplements, and we've seen this, especially like drugs like ephedra, are downright dangerous. This was common in the 80s and 90s, and there's some baseball players that died suddenly after taking uh, ephedra-containing supplements. Many supplements interact with other medications, and really, the entire supplement industry is unregulated. So the safety and purity is entirely in the hands of the manufacturer, and I always ask my patients, is it sawdust or is it ginkgo biloba? Do you know? And the answer is you don't. If it's an unregulated industry, no one's out there making sure that what's in that pill is what they say it is, if it's not regulated. And this is why an unregulated industry is really somewhat of a it's like rolling the dice every time you take it. So the prescription for vitamins is no supplement required. Myth number five, if I'm thin and I exercise regularly, uh, I should be immune to cardiovascular disease. Where's Sheila? She's in this audience. Thank you. Thin and uh, regularly exercise. My two favorite uh, some e-cards are Pilates. Oh, heavens no, I thought you said pie and lattes. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite exercise at the gym would probably be judging, right? <laughs> now, of course, not everybody in this audience has these opinions. So I pulled up the President's um, uh, Committee on Physical Fitness, and these are the recommendations that uh, your U.S. government tells you you should be doing relative to exercise children and adolescents. And I focus really in this discussion on adolescents and adults. Greater than 60 minutes of physical exercise daily is the recommended time. Moderate or vigorous intensity of aerobic physical activity at least three days a week to include muscle and bone strengthening exercises. And this is the rest of us, 18 to 64. Um, Adults should get two and a half hours, that's 150 minutes each week of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity at least 10 minutes at a time. As intervals shorter than this do not have the same health benefits, this should include strengthening activities like push-ups, sit-ups, weightlifting at least two days a week. How much are you doing? That's the question. And I put this slide in here to say, relative to exercise, what's my risk? You know, inactivity and obesity are two of the many cardiovascular risk factors, but probably not the strongest. Exercise is great, but not necessarily enough to know your risk. This is the picture of Jim Fix. Anybody remember Jim Fix? This guy wrote a book called The Complete Book of Running. He was a big runner, but he started out as a heavy young man who smoked two packs a day. He became trimmer middle-aged non-smoking athlete, and seemed to ensure a healthy lifestyle, but he died at age 52 while jogging in Vermont. So what does this say? This says his risk increased well before he decided to take up jogging. 
So this continuum of risk is really what you need to think about. I need to start healthy and stay healthy. And exercise is an important component of it. But one day picking up exercise doesn't reduce your risk if you implanted your risk years before with smoking and inactivity. So here's our traditional cardiac risk factors. The ones you can't modify are your age, your gender, although there's some gender modification going on these days, um, <laughs> or your heredity. You can't change that. The modifiable risk factors are really tobacco use, which you can stop or never start, your cholesterol, we have medicines to modify that, exercise and diets modify that, your blood pressure is a modifiable risk factor, even if you inherited, there's medicines to lower blood pressure. Diabetes, uh, the majority of diabetes in the United States is acquired. It's acquired as an adult. It can actually be reduced by staying trim and exercising uh, regularly and appropriate diet. Physical inactivity, all you need to do is exercise more, and really the overweight condition is associated with a lot of these, associated with diabetes, associated with high blood pressure, associated with abnormal cholesterol. And these really are the cardiac risk factors that are reduced with exercise. Exercise doesn't change these, but really, people who exercise don't smoke as much. That's been well documented. Exercise lowers LDL cholesterol and raises HDL cholesterol, our good cholesterol, lowers the bad, raises the good. It lowers blood pressure. It reduces the risk for diabetes. And of course, if you're exercising, you're not physically inactive, and it can help you keep your weight in check. So the facts about exercise are really is there is a dose-response relationship. More is better. Strenuous exercise is probably better than less strenuous exercise. And several studies have shown that repeated intermittent periods of exercise have a cumulative similar effect to prolonged exercise. So a little bit every day is the same as a lot three times a week. So physical activity, the information on it's pretty interesting. Only one in three children are physically active every day. Less than 5% of adults participate in 30 minutes of physical activity every day. Only one in three adults receive the recommended amount of physical activity each week. Only 35 to 40% of adults age 75 or older are physically active. And then of 65 to 74 year olds, 28% are inactive. More than 80% of adults do not meet the guidelines for aerobic or muscle strengthening activities and more than 80% of adolescents do not do enough activity to meet the guidelines. Conclusion is regular exercise modifies risk factors for heart disease, and your prescription here is physically strenuous exercise, 35 minutes most days of the week, aerobic, with weight training, strength training, weight-bearing exercise, and you can refill this prescription daily. Okay, myth number six. Most women do not experience chest pain during a heart attack. Fatigue and shortness of breath are much more common. And we've all appreciated, uh, based on my earlier slide, that men and women are different. But the question is, do they present with a heart attack differently? So the facts are, chest discomfort is the most common symptom of a heart attack, both in men and in women. But women are more likely than men to have additional non-specific symptoms, which include fatigue, shortness of breath, and weakness. And that's played out in this diagram, looking at the symptoms of presentation of a heart attack, women in purple, men in blue. So chest pain is still a predominant complaint, with men complaining of it more than women. But then when you get to these other symptoms, unusual fatigue, shortness of breath, and weakness, it's uh, really more common in women than men. So we should just appreciate that when a woman comes to the emergency room, and says, I'm just not feeling like myself, we do an EKG. You know, we just don't assume that they're having a bad day. And I think healthcare uh, providers, um, we need to be vigilant about that. It's very clear that if we underestimate someone's risk, we underestimate the test, the appropriate test to do. So that's really a part of why I'm here as well, to talk about, you know, the differences in how people come to healthcare. Um, the location of the chest pain, really it's the jaw and the neck that are more common in women than men, but the rest of them are about the same. And then the quality of the chest pain, you know, it's really not that different. The quality is about the same in both women and men, women and men. So the facts are men and women present relatively similarly for both genders. It's important to point out 
is not to ignore the symptoms of these potentially life-threatening problems. It's interesting, women do present at older age, and they have a higher mortality rate when they do present uh, compared to the ma man of their same age. They actually have smaller arteries, and there's more complications with, with healthcare among women, and so these are some areas that we can improve on. Myth number seven, chocolate is sinfully bad and should be eaten only rarely. This you're gonna love. This could be true, but there's some, some preliminary data suggesting that dark chocolate may actually be beneficial. Dark chocolate raises good cholesterol, we like that. Dark chocolate improves insulin sensitivity. That means you use glucose better. It lowers blood pressure. It improves endothelial function, which really means it makes vessels work better. Is this clinically relevant? Not sure, but take a dark chocolate bar, 100 grams, one bar daily, 30 day supply, and you can refill this as needed. <laughs> Applause from the audience, there you go. Okay, myth number eight. My diet contributes more to my cardiovascular risk than my size, right? Is it the cheeseburger or the, uh, the, the baked chicken? And uh, if I'm running on the beach but I weigh more than I should for my height, uh, where's my risk? Um, perception really is everything, you know. I'm not fat, I'm just a little husky, right? So uh, following a healthy lifestyle can really help you, but also your children, prevent or control uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors. Lifestyle habits really do begin in childhood, right? Parents and families really should encourage their children to make heart and healthy lifestyle choices. I don't know about you, but I have a 12-year-old, and you know, I, over the last year or two, he comes home, and, and you know, if, if I pull out something that's wrapped in a plastic wrapper, he says, Dad, that's not good for you. You know, you should, you should be able to tell what it is without it being wrapped, right? So if it's an apple, it's probably good for you because it looks like an apple. But if it's, you know, processed and in a plastic bag, it's probably not good for me. Smart, you know, children these days. But it really, this is where the risk starts, so this is where the education should start. Really, so you and your children can lower your heart disease risk by maintaining healthy weight, following a healthy diet, regular physical activity, and not smoking. Um, already, if you already have heart disease, certainly lifestyle changes can help you control your risk factors. So, you, so if you have a heart attack, or had a stent, or had a, a stroke, uh, certainly lifestyle changes are important to control the risk factors for progression of disease. Um, being overweight increases the risk of the following, and this is really where it's at. If you're overweight, you increase your risk for high blood pressure, you increase your risk for diabetes, you increase your risk for sleep apnea or difficulty breathing, uh, mostly at night, and then abnormal heart, uh, I'm sorry, abnormal lipids like cholesterol. And it actually, being overweight, you know, increase your risk for joint pains, and that's gonna limit your mobility. So when people say, you know, is it my diet or my weight? Weight clearly contributes to these risk factors. And if you can't move, you can't exercise. If you can't exercise, you can't reduce your risk. Lifestyle changes really aren't, I'm sorry, if light lifestyle changes aren't enough, your doctor may recommend other treatments. And I put this up here simply to remind myself about the emerging data on weight loss surgery. If you're morbidly obese, Actually, weight loss surgery has been shown not to reduce your cardiovascular risk, and so you should discuss that with your doctor. Um, and again, your primary care physician or even your cardiologist, cardiologist can help you find out whether you have cardiovascular disease risk factors and help you create a plan to reduce your risk for heart attack and other heart problems. Children with cardiovascular risk factors really should be considered for treatments with lifestyle modification and failing that treatment. We have data now that inherited cholesterol abnormalities called familial hypercholesterolemia, that really should be treated uh, in childhood. And we have data to support that now. So getting your children screened if you have a high degree of risk of heart disease in your family is reasonable. So the nutritional data is that the typical American diet exceeds the recommended intake levels or limits in the following four categories. So we basically get too many calories from solid fats and added sugars we consume too many refined grains as opposed to the natural grains, we take in too much sodium or salt, and we take in too much saturated fat. This is the Western diet. 
Americans eat less than the recommended amounts of, this is what we don't get enough of, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, dairy products, and oils. We're talking about the good oils and the, and the low-flat dairy products. About 90% of Americans eat more sodium or salt than is recommended in a healthy diet. Salt's hard to get away from in the Western world. It's certainly what makes you enjoy the food product that's served at somebody's restaurant. Salty foods taste good, unfortunately. Reducing sodium, they estimate, uh, by 1,200 milligrams per day could ultimately save about 20 billion in medical costs. That's a lot of money. And you know, salt really drives high blood pressure. That's what it drives. So a low sodium diet helps control your high blood pressure. So how about um, comparisons? People always ask me, what should I eat? So I'm gonna point to the Mediterranean diet because compared to the typical US diet, it reduced cardiovascular major events by 73% when studied, okay? Mediterranean versus the US diet. The Mediterranean diet really emphasizes primary plant-based foods, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes uh, and nuts. It replaces butter with healthy fats such as olive oil, uses herbs and spices instead of salt, and limits red meat to no more than a few times a month. Why is this a Mediterranean diet recommended? Because these people live long in the Mediterranean, that's why, and they don't have cardiovascular disease at the same rate. And here is the slide depicting healthy, happy people living longer. 98-year-old man and his wife from one of the Greek islands. This guy's Mr. Moraitis, who lives in Ikeria. He's 102. He's famous for partying and makes 400 liters of wine from his vineyard each year. He drinks with his friends. His house is the social hotspot of the island, and his 85-year-old girlfriend is pictured above, right? <laughs> makes you all want to move to a Greek island, right? So the diet recommendation is Mediterranean. Fewer calories than you think. Daily with laughter and wine is optional. Refill it as needed. So in summary, and we're getting toward the end here, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the Western world, both of men and women. You can work to reduce your risk for traditional risk factors throughout your life specifically focus on trying to avoid high blood pressure, diabetes, and avoiding tobacco. Healthy lifestyles should start early and include a focus on children as well as adults. Ovarian hormone therapy is okay in younger women with premature or surgical menopause, and it should be tapered in the early 50s. A balanced diet is probably more helpful than vitamins and supplements, and exercise is beneficial. You should do it regularly. So today we tried to help you understand about raising awareness of cardiovascular disease, identifying your own risk, specifically blood pressure, your weight according to your height, cholesterol, fasting blood sugar. Um, there's opportunity to know whether you're sitting there growing plaque and that's really a calcium score. We talked about that as a CT scan to pick up calcium in the wall of the vessels in the heart. Understanding your contributable as well as your inherited risk, what risk was I born with, and what risk am I adding myself by my level of activity, the type of things I eat and whether I smoke or not, and then lowering your own risk. Exercise, managing your weight, choosing your dietary uh, 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 intake, Mediterranean diet, optimizing the blood pressure, avoiding tobacco products, and optimizing your cholesterol. You know, one of the things about calcium scoring, and I, I mentioned uh, this to a patient this morning, um, the, one of the most interesting studies ever done was the recruits that came back from uh, uh, Vietnam uh, uh, in, that were killed there. A pathologist looked at their coronary arteries. So these are healthy 19 to 25 year olds that are lugging you know, 90 pound backs through the jungle. Um, and when they were killed in war, somebody looked at their heart arteries and they had the beginnings of build up a plaque in the vessel wall in some of the healthiest 19 to 25 year olds in the, in the country. So this is a disease process that begins early, and that's why I focus a little bit on the children and trying to address their risk early as well. Um, and so, you know, it, it comes up and gets you when you're 55, 65, 75, and 85, but the disease process builds in the vessel wall early in life. So today I'm trying to encourage you, fight like a girl, but fight the number one killer of women, which is cardiovascular disease. Any questions? 
Sure. Yeah, so that's a great question. The question is, um, basically, people have symptoms in the lower anterior chest all the time, and how do I know whether it's my hiatal hernia or my acid reflux or my heart attack, right? Um, and, you know, I, I, when I'm asked this in my clinic, I tell people this is why God invented cardiologists. That's for us to help you determine whether it's your heart or your esophagus because clearly it can feel the same. And we've seen this over and over again. And that's why some people stay at home. They think they have acid reflux, um, but they might be having a heart attack. Um, There's some classic features that are very clearly related to hiatal hernias, acid reflux. Many times those symptoms are worse when you are supine, lying down because you don't have gravity to hold acid here in the bottom of your stomach. When you lie flat, it can roll up through a hiatal hernia into the esophagus. So, so many times it's supine. Laying down wakes me up in the middle of the night. I take some antacids, I get better. That's a classic chronic history. I will tell you though, people have heart attacks laying down too. So you know, it's, it's not as if it rules it out. I think it starts by asking yourself, what's my cardiovascular disease risk, right? So if I have chest pain and I'm a 55-year-old smoking diabetic with high blood pressure, I should be evaluated. If I have supine chest pain that wakes me up, gets better when I belch or you know, have some antacids, and I'm a healthy 52-year-old like myself, then I, my risk for cardiovascular disease is low. Especially if, I've, if I don't have cardiovascular disease in my family, and especially if I've had a good diet, I've exercised regularly. So it's all about what your risk is to find the problem that you're looking for. So again, seek your primary care physician and say, what's my cardiovascular disease risk? And is it as low as I can get it? And also, if you have some symptoms, you can discuss it with your primary care doctor. They'll refer you to the cardiologist, you get a stress test, evaluation, this type of thing. So the answer is not black and white, but it involves that type of discussion. Very good question. Other questions? In the back. Um, if you're thinking that you might be having a heart attack and you know that you have reflux, should you take your blood pressure? And if it's the normal blood pressure that you would normally have, even if it is high or low or whatever it is, are you okay then to assume that it's not a heart attack? Right. So the assessment of blood pressure during the onset of any symptom is not really a good uh, arbiter of risk. It doesn't tell you what's going on. Um, you know, people, if they have pain, they're excited, they're anxious, their blood pressure can be high. And it's because you're anxious and wondering what's going on. Um, so it doesn't really help you. Um, I would say that, um, you know, if you're having discomfort that's unrelenting, that's why we invented the 911 system. It's okay to use it. You, your tax dollars pay for it, right? Uh, get evaluated. Um, you know, clearly pain that comes and goes, it's not a big bothersome thing, but if it changes in frequency or severity, those are signs to go get it looked at, right? Good question, though. Any other questions? How about the middle table right there? This is a little off the subject, but is there any way to predict if someone is going to be uh, susceptible to uh, altitude sickness at, at high uh, elevations? Is it is it associated with the same um, cardiovascular health in your numbers, or can perfectly fit healthy people get bad altitude sickness? So um, the question is about altitude sickness. I would tell you it's not my area of expertise, but what we do know is that um, you know oxygen contents lower as you go up in the atmosphere. And so uh, on the 19th of this month, when my son and I are going to go skiing out west, you know I'm going to be more short of breath than I'm here at sea level. There's just no two ways about it. Um, and so, th and there really is no way to predict who's going to feel worse or better. I will tell you that people in, in good athletic condition have fewer symptoms related to altitude sickness than people who are in poor physical condition. And, you know, you can discuss that with your own physician about your, you know, safety of traveling to, you know, 14,000 feet or whatever. But, you know, when it comes down to it, there's really no clear-cut predictors. I would just say people who are healthier do better. Any other questions? 
Um, is the calcium score CT scan considered a, a, a typical test and will my insurance cover it? Can I just go get it's a, it? It's a very good question. We wish, we wish every insurance company would pay for it and most of them don't. Um, and unfortunately, um, they don't because they would be doing calcium scores on everybody in the United States. That's really the answer because, you know, if it's the number one killer, it's a screening test for it. Um, insurance companies would have to pay for it. It is predictive of risk. Uh, the higher the calcium score, the higher the event rate. Um, I would tell you that in most, um, if you go through your primary care physician or see a cardiologist, most of us have relationships with, with an imaging center or either a hospital or freestanding imaging center. You can get it at less than 200 bucks. Um, but I tell you, it is the test in intermediate risk patients or low risk patients that tells you whether I'm sitting there growing plaque or not, because if it's been there for a while, it'll calcify and we can pick it up. Higher risk patients, I don't need it. You're a higher risk patient. I'm going to do a different test because I, your risk is so high. I assume you have the disease process already. I'm going to do it to figure out how much you have. Like I'm going to do a heart catheterization or a stress test or something like this. Yes. Great question. Once a calcium, um, uh, or once a plaque is calcified in the vessel wall, calcium doesn't go anywhere. It's really a marker of plaque burden, and it doesn't go away. Now, if you have soft plaque, soft plaque has been shown to regress in aggressive cholesterol lowering trials. So, you know, if I have a, um, if I, like the woman, the 38 year old woman that we, that we managed with the acute heart attack that came in. I bet you her calcium score is zero because it's not like she's had a whole lot of time to sit there and develop plaque, but she did have a heart attack. So we're not even going to do a calcium score on her. We're going to just give her the meds to lower her risk. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to waste the money to find out the snapshot of her coronaries. We just took one with a heart catheterization, right? Good question, though. How do rates of restenosis differ between the genders? Say that again? Rates of restenosis between men and women, do they differ? Okay, so the question is about restenosis. Let me tell you, restenosis is scarring after a balloon angioplasty or a stent procedure. So what she's asking about, if we look at men who have a coronary stent versus women, is there a higher restenosis or scarring rate? The answer is it's not gender specific. But women who get stents have smaller arteries, and smaller arteries have a higher restenosis rate than, men, than bigger arteries. Women are older when they get stents, and women have more other risk factors for heart disease when they get stents. So in general, it's not gender is the predictor. The predictor is vessel size, literally lesion length, and the presence or absence of diabetes. Those are the predictors of restenosis. Vessel size, lesion length, diabetic status. Uh, yes, um, what recommendation do you have for someone who was very, very active and then going um, from very active to moderately active. And this year I've had a lot of um, joint pain. Right. So I'm not able to walk like I used to. Great question. You know, um, I, I'm 52, I, I got a knee, I can't run, right? My, I got a bunion, I can't run. But what do I do? I get on a stationary bike. Um, and so the, the answer is accommodation. That's the answer. Um, Jacksonville, you know, although it rains 300 days out of 365, um, you can get outside most of the year. Um, so if you're able to, to be ambulatory, that's one thing, but stationary bike, um, water aerobics, anything sitting down moving at the same time. I mean, why do I do the stationary bike? Because I can also, you know, watch ESPN and listen to something and multitask at the same time, right? Have a cup of coffee. So I, th I think we all should, should, number one, in our effort to stay active, find accommodation. And it's all about finding accommodation. Not everybody has a pool in their backyard, but the YMCA's here are some of the best in the country. I was just at one with my 76-year-old mom the other day, the one in the, off the Deerwood. That's like the best YMCA I've ever seen in my life, right? They've got every form of exercise over there, both stationary and non-stationary. Um, weight training does not you know, mean that you need to be uh, weight-bearing. You can sit down and lift weights, okay? So again, accommodation, do what you can. The other thing is evaluate what's limiting you. You know, we replace joints like, you know, people drink water now, right? So if you got a joint that needs to replace and can get you more active, seek that therapy. Go through your primary care doctor. If they say, 
you know, uh, you don't need that. Get a second opinion. You're, you you got to be your own healthcare advocate. You really do. Other questions? Um, if you are a patient, ex-cancer patient, but you always are a cancer patient, and you've had chemo, you've had radiation, you've always had a good um, blood pressure, no diabetes, and suddenly um, the doctor gives you a halter monitor because he detects some issue with your heart rate, and the heart rate is determined to be rapid, and puts you on a medication for that, along with your e estrogen inhibitor. Should you see a cardiologist? Yeah, it's a great question. So the answer is, um, you know, is, there, is there any relationship between cancer, cancer treatments, and cardiovascular disease or heart disease? The answer is yes. Um, basically, what we've learned, and it's been through a series of years of learning this more because we're paying more attention to cancer patients because they're living longer, right? I mean, that's really, the, that's really why you can develop heart disease after you have a diagnosis of cancer because you're now living longer. Um, there's a lot of chemotherapy-related cardiovascular toxicity. That means some of those drugs that kill the cells that are the dividing cancer cells can, both early on and later on, cause changes in heart function. Um, and just, you know, it's a simple concept. Chemotherapy kills rapidly dividing cells or specific cells that utilize something that the chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agent can inhibit. There are some side effects on heart muscle cells during chemotherapy that, that are both early we see it in some drugs and even years later. So the answer is yes, absolutely. And the best way to understand that is with an ultrasound image of the heart called an echocardiogram. We put it on your chest and we turn on the ultrasound and we see the wall motion, the wall thickness, the valves, other things. And really what you're looking for is, is there any change in heart function related to the exposure to chemotherapy? Um, you know, one of the other great things about cancer therapies is we're getting new ones all the time and very specific ones, not just specific to like, I got lung cancer but I got like lung cancer with this type, with this cellular phenotype, with this genetic predisposition. And you can tailor the drug specifically to that, but it, with new drugs comes literally, we gotta take, wait years to see what they may have also exposed you to. So it, it clearly is evolving, changing field, lots of variables, um, but you know, surviving cancer, unfortunately gives you risk to get heart disease, and the answer is yes. But we'll take advantage of the survival part. Yes, I have one. Um, it just involved knowing my risk. I don't have high blood pressure. I do exercise at least three times a week. Um, but I went in to have an exam with my doctor. My cholesterol was high. And he wanted to put me on a mild sedative. Well, me trying to fight like a girl, I said, <laughs> let me, I felt it was associated with me gaining 20 pounds, Sure. so I said give me three months, two, three months. To see before, if weight loss and exercise weight loss and lifestyle and exercise modification. And lifestyle would yeah. change it. Yeah. And let's say if I did do that, is it a chance I can still have to do cholesterol medicine? That, that's a great question. And so the modern cardiologist listens to that question and says the following. I'm interested in lowering your risk for a heart attack and stroke. I'm not so much interested in lowering your number, but if they go together, fine, right? So cholesterol is just one of those things we look at. So my answer is, what's your risk for heart attack and stroke and how can I lower it? That's my answer. If it involves cholesterol, we'll attack cholesterol. And we might attack it with both lifestyle modification, but if you're a high risk patient, it's really the statin drugs have lowered the risk for heart attack and stroke in people at high risk. And that's what somebody's gonna pull off the shelf if you want modern healthcare. Now I will tell you, and this question is probably the most common one I get. You know, I've read all this stuff on the internet, doc, about statins that kill your liver, should I take it, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is, statins are the only class of drugs that lowers your heart attack and stroke rate and also lowers your cholesterol. There's a bunch of drugs, diets, exercise, everything can lower your cholesterol. The question is, what lowers your risk for heart attack and stroke? Because really, I want that. That's what you want. 
So that's the question to answer, ask your doctor. And really, if you're sitting there and you go get a calcium score and you've been growing plaque for years, you're gonna do both. You're gonna get a drug and lifestyle modification because that's how I lower your risk the most. But that's a great question. I get it all the time. Um, and you know, we all want to not take a drug. Believe me, I don't want to take a drug, right? Um, what drug do you and I take every day? Everybody in this room. Fluoride in the water, right? Did you sign up for that? No, if it's somebody that, you know, Center for Disease Control said our teeth will stay in our mouth, we you know, drink fluoride, right? So, you know, there are some things that we do uh, to reduce our risk for problems that we've accepted as sort of public health issues. Um, so your public health really, uh, you know, your, your marching orders here are evaluate your risk for heart disease and try to get as low as possible because it's your number one risk out there, right? Other question? I think we have time for one more question. Okay, how about back here? Um, what about those uh, life lifeline screening tests? Is uh, they all right to take? Say that again. Life those lifeline screening tests that they have. Screening tests. Life. Yeah. Screening tests for vascular disease. Is that the question? Uh, you know, there's a lot of, and uh, the, one of the more common ones is uh, a truck will pull up at a church and people go out and get scanned with ultrasound and they get their blood pressure checked. Let me tell you, any screening is fine. Believe me, get screened. The question is, is what do you do when you get the information? That's the question. Take it to your physician and have a discussion. I would tell you, most of, mo most of these mobile screening uh, um, scenarios, uh, I, I think they're great because they get people wondering about what's going on inside them, so I'm not against them at all. I just think the answers, then you need to be able to take the answers to somebody to help you make sense of it. Um, you know, my favorite, uh, like one of my, a cath lab nurse has bought me a cup and on the outside it says, don't confuse your Google website with my MD, right? You know, so the answer is your doctor's trained to understand uh, really how the data that you've generated from this test applies to you. So, um, you know, we, we all, uh, uh, are, believe me, the websites are great. Google's the best thing ever because you know, I can find my way here, right? You know, so <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, really when it comes down to your health for you and what the the findings on the screening test mean for you, you need a physician to take a look at it. Thanks so much for coming. Um, if you'll fill out the survey on the form, we're gonna have a drawing for uh, a $50 gift card and I will be mailing that to the lucky winner. And uh, thanks so much. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate the opportunity.